the privilege of being the chair of the Foundation Trust. And the first thing I have to do tonight is to explain to you that this is not the meeting we had planned. So um, it'll be, I think, probably a relatively short meeting. Uh, and the reason for this is that the Parliament, in its infinite wisdom, has decided to call an election. And the reason, uh, and um, when election is called, all public bodies are put into what's called perda, which is no comment of any controversial <coughs> nature whatsoever shall be made. And especially from the announcements made today by one of the um, parties, the NHS is, of course, particularly sensitive. So what does this mean for tonight and for the Trust? Well, it means we can't talk about the future, and we can't do questions and answers. So as I say, it might be a shorter meeting than usual, but we have a solution, a little solution, anyway, to the question and answer session. Which, although we can't answer questions tonight, if you have a question, you've got slips you can ask the question on, and we'll take it away, and after Perda is finished, and whatever election <coughs> results come out are out, we can then answer the question, uh, or refer them to somebody, somewhere else if it's not a question for us. However, there are things we can do. We can present our recent performance and activities, and at least you know where we are now as opposed to talk about the future. And what we decided we would do is start with a patient story. The board of the trust starts its meetings with a patient story and ends with a staff story. And so I'd like to remind you, as members of the public and friends of the trust, that you have the opportunity to attend any one of our public board meetings and at those meetings you can ask questions so i would urge you to come to those and, and do it and then if you come you will see these presentations which are core to what we do so we'll start with a patient and client story um, i warn you it's nine minutes long but tonight we have some time and it's worth listening to it, 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 it tells you something about what we do and how we do it and the impact it has on people's lives. And I would ask Paul if she just present the program to us. And I should say, yes, that's what we're going to go through in the program. Paula. Thank you, Michael. Um, so just to um, introduce the patient story to you this evening, I think, as Michael said, really importantly, we start each and every board meeting with a journey of care story where we sit and we really listen intently to an individual telling their own story of the care that they've received from um, us as an organisation and sometimes more broadly us as a health and care system. It helps us really importantly to keep really focused on why it is we all as members of the board come to work every day. So this story tonight, as Michael's already said, is nine minutes long, so please be patient with it. It is a really touching and important story. It's told by a gentleman and his reflections on the journey that his wife took through her end of life journey. It talks about how supported he and his wife felt and how coordinated the care around them was. So it is quite difficult to listen to, there's a lot of emotion in it, but I think we all feel as a board, that's okay, because actually if we introduce a little bit of emotion into our board meetings, it helps us to really focus through every single conversation we have thereafter in those meetings. So I'll say no more about it, and I'll hand over to um, the gentleman who will be telling the story. I can't remember exactly when, but we had a lady here, probably about um, three, four years ago, that came from the social to see whether uh, we, uh, they could help in any way. At that time, we were thinking about having um, a carer to look after Doreen because I was finding it a little bit uh, hard going. and. 
we were told that at that time that we couldn't, uh, we, because of my savings or the money in our current account, that we weren't able to, uh, shall we say, get any help. As the time went on, I then arranged that we would, uh, well, that we definitely need someone to help with Doreen getting uh, washed of a morning and dressed and for bed of an evening. And the social worker, at that time, we had a new social worker came, a young, young lady called Shelley. And I think we were the first, I'll say, uh, say customers <laughs> uh, that Shelley had uh, dealt with. And she was absolutely brilliant. And she made inquiries so that we was able to get some help. As Doreen got progressively worse, then we needed more help. And in November last year, Doreen had had a couple of falls previously and had to go to the hospital um, where they kept her in a couple of times. Uh, but in November, when she went in, she had two falls on the Sunday. I don't think any of us realised at the time that she would not be coming home. It seemed that once Doreen had gone into hospital, she deteriorated rapidly. When she was at home, just prior to that, she was becoming more and more, shall we say, awkward in her movements and that. Um, she wasn't eating as well or drinking as well as she would normally do. But then when she went into hospital, everything seemed to go downhill. And eventually was told that she would not be able to come home, that she would need a 24-hour care and would have to go into a nursing home. Jill, the social worker, became involved then, and she was absolutely brilliant. And I, I must have been, shall we say, hell, because I kept trying to get Jill to move as quickly as she could to get Doreen out of the hospital because I could see she was so deteriorating. And Jill worked miracles and we managed to get Doreen into nursing home. And Jill worked miracles and managed to get Doreen some help, uh, like some funding for us. And we got Doreen into, um, but at that time, I did not know how ill Doreen was. No one had told me that because she wasn't eating or drinking, uh, it was just a question of time. She wasn't eating, she wasn't drinking. And I was there, I got there between 10 and half 10 every day and never left till seven, or half seven or eight o'clock at night. And I was getting really disappointed. I thought that taking her into uh, a care home, she would have more attention in there, but it didn't work out like that. And then after she'd been there, I think it must have been about six or seven days, I was so disgusted with, I'll say, the lack of care that she was getting there, that I got my daughter and granddaughter to start looking for other nursing homes. And then Denise came in, I think it was on the Monday, I'm not quite sure. Uh, Denise came in to assess Doreen. And it was then, because I wanted to move her to another nursing home, she came in to see if that, I think, if that was the best for Doreen's interest. And it was then that Denise told me that she had about four or five days to, to live. <sighs> and it was in Doreen's best interest for her to stay in the nursing home. And that night, I couldn't sleep, decided that no, I was going to have her home. And um, I phoned Denise on the Tuesday morning to say, that I was taking Doreen home and she said, well, you can't do that. Doreen needs 24 hour a day care 
and you know you've got to be able to provide 24 hour daycare I said well she's not getting 24 hour daycare here I said you don't see anyone here so she said well you've got to get things sorted out if you want Doreen home you need to get the social workers involved the care home involved to see whether they can do what needed to be done so I'm not sure if we contacted Jill or Denise contacted Jill, but Jill was absolutely brilliant. She was trying to get, because Jill was arranged for us to get help, she'd got funding for so much and then I was topping it up. And then she said, well, I'm not sure if you will get the funding when you need to take Doreen home. I said, I don't care about that, I want a home. Well, she's only got a few days I want to live with the family. So Denise, Jill got in touch with Home Instead and Home Instead on the Wednesday morning said, um, George, we're happy. We can look after Dora. They said, we've already spoken to Jill. We've spoken to Denise. An ambulance is ready uh, for Dora at four o'clock this afternoon. Yeah. I'm done. I think you had arranged for a special bed to be delivered that day and the um, the carers would be there when Doreen came home. I just broke down. I, I just, it was unbelievable. I had no idea that it would happen so quickly and I couldn't believe all the work that they'd put in to make it happen. There was Jill, Denise, and the care home, early carers. We came home, and the carers was already here, and we got Doreen into bed, and she was there for eight days. We had two carers here. One carer was for 24 hours a day. Another carer was here for the night shift, and then we had two carers come in during the course of the day to help the other carer because she had to be turned every uh, every few hours and then the community nurses who were absolutely brilliant they came in to start giving Dora morphine and see how she was and uh, what have you so everybody was absolutely brilliant I, I telephoned Jill to thank her and Denise because they were absolutely brilliant and I could not have done it without them and I've told them that. Yeah. Without them, there's no way that I could have brought Doreen home. Yeah. And I said to the, the children, I said I would never ever have forgiven myself if I hadn't got your mum home. No. So my experience with the social workers, the community nurses and everybody else involved couldn't have been any better. It was brilliant. Worth nine minutes. It illustrates that we are a health and care foundation trust. And for those of you who might be tempted to come to our board meetings <coughs> in the future, when we have these stories, they're not always positive. It's important we live, we listen to the negative ones as well as the positive ones so we can learn from it. On that note, Karen, it's your session for report. Good evening. Um, it's not easy to follow something like that. Um, I'm going to give you some facts, figures, information about the organisation that are gonna sound really quite dry compared to what you've just listened to. But the reason why we keep this organization fit for purpose and the reason why we do what I'm gonna to present to you is really so we can do that. We can do what you've just listened to and we can do it well. Because it's not just about providing that service to that gentleman and his wife and their family. It's also about looking after the workforce that we employ to do that, health and social care services. 
So this is going to be a bit dry and I apologise for that, but it's important that you understand the fitness of this organisation to do that and that's why we do it. So, I'm going to make you laugh now and say I've got these slides in front of me and I'm at that age now where I can't actually see them. So <laughs> We continue, uh, bearing in mind this is the year 1819, so it's a year behind. We do continue to be a significant leader and indeed a partner in the healthcare system of Wirral and Cheshire East, where we've got contracts as well. We've maintained over a million um, patient contacts a year and we continue to meet our financial targets, more of which Mark will talk about shortly, and our KPIs, KPIs just performance targets that are commissioners and sometimes we set for ourselves to achieve if we focus on a particular area to improve the service delivery. Most importantly for this year though, we had a CQC inspection, which I have to say we weren't thrilled about the result of. Um, and I would say that um, we took it on the chin and we took all of the recommendations and we have attended to every single one of them well, very well. And we are eagerly awaiting another inspection. In fact, we are almost pushing for another inspection. 100% um, of our quality rated goals are rated amber and green, and Paula will talk more about that shortly. I think it's important as any organisation, responsible organisation going forward and maintaining a business in the future, is that we attend to the environmental agenda, the green agenda, and we do that, and we do that very, very well. Uh, it also, um, we've got 80 volunteers in the organisation, and we've taken on in this year 19 apprentices. That's something that we want to build on for the future. We work with the local authority, for those of you who don't understand what we mean by, because we do tend to use jargon in the public sector, don't we? But we've got nine neighbourhoods across the entirety of Wirral, and we work with a specific environment in Cheshire West as well, uh, sorry, Cheshire East as well. Um, the the neighbourhoods are built up out of something called super output areas, and what that means is there's, they are assessed as they're, uh, are based on their needs according to the communities that live in those neighbourhoods. That's just a better way of us targeting our resources appropriately to meet the needs of that community. But we work with the local, uh, local authority on that. So we do build strong relationships with all partner organisations. Just want to say something, we rolled out um, across a couple of, um, in the early part of this year, a tele-triage system which is a digital way using iPads to support both patients and workforces in care homes and this organisation to work better, closer together, to have a, a more accessible instant response for our patients. And we ended up rolling that out across 76 in the end. It was so successful and it continues to be incredibly successful. It's also helping our hospital become more efficient because it's keeping people out of hospital when they don't normally need to go in, but they couldn't get access, they couldn't get a response. So we now send our tele-triage <coughs> service there. Importantly, and we're in the middle of this campaign now, um, we reached a uh, well over the required 75% target for this year for flu vaccinations. We achieved just under 78, which is really important, of protecting not just the workforce, but local people. And we continue to um, in develop our inclusion agenda to ensure that everybody is treated in the same way, both workforce and our patients. Uh, I probably just wanted to say something on the last bullet point on this. So as a result of our CQC inspection, we have implemented and developed with a software company um, a framework to measure our excellence, how we're improving our services from a quality perspective, rather than just a key performance indicator that's a number. Um, and that's been incredibly successful. Obviously can't take questions on that tonight, but if anybody wants to know more about that, please contact the organisation and we'll help you understand what that is. And I guess, um, finally, and this 
sort of takes us back to the beginning of this uh, presentation. We're really proud that during this year, uh, we did integrate adult social care properly. This was year two, I think, mm -hmm. of our integration agenda, bringing health and social care professionals together to form a single uninterrupt un uninterrupted offer to the patient and their families. We saw 6,000 new referrals just in that year. Um, we created a single point of access for referring clinicians and indeed local people. So rather than be bounced around the system and told to ring somebody else and ring somebody else, you ring this number, you get in and we navigate you and help you around the, uh, the system. We took 40,000 telephone calls to this service in that year. 3,000 contacts and importantly, 350 safeguarding inquiries every month, every single month into this service. We obviously did a really good job and we obviously continue to do a good job and I'm very, very proud of this because we were referenced in the Chief Social Workers um, Adult Social Care Report. That's high praise indeed. We continue to be audited. We continue to audit ourselves in terms of our integration um, of this service and we continue to um, come out with good reports. So we're really doing, doing very well. Um, and I have to say, it's, it's a wonderful environment to work in, both across health and social care. So that's just a representation. Clearly this year was the 70th birthday of the NHS, so we had our own celebrations in the grounds of St Catherine's um, Health Centre, which was just extraordinary. Uh, we work with, I want you to understand also, that we work with the future generations. So in the past, prior to this year, we uh, were working with young people as old as 14 and 15 to influence and shape them the way they think and they might want careers in the public sector. This year we started working with eight and nine year olds because it is recognised um, and evidenced that actually this is the fundamental age at which to start working with people to shape the way they think and about their own um, careers and how they have aspirations for the future. And we wanted to help them aspire to be the best they can be. Doesn't matter if they don't want to work with us. The important thing is they have aspirations for themselves for the future, improving their self-esteem and their self-worth. So, and that's our award ceremony. So, all in all, 2018, 19, that's right, isn't it? I keep on showing <laughs> myself. Um, told you I was getting that old. Um, was a very, very successful year for this organisation and long may it continue. I think that's my last slide. I'm going to hand over now to Mark who's going to take you through the finance. Yeah, got it right. Finance review of our organisation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Good evening, everyone. Um, so you've just heard and you'll continue to hear tonight uh, from others about uh, how proud we are of our staff, proud of the services we provide and um, provi uh, proud of the care we provide to uh, the people we serve across Cheshire and Wirral. But we're also very proud of our financial performance. So I'm going to talk you through some of our highlights um, financial performance for the year um, April 2018 through to March 2019. Um, this is uh, a highlighted version, but the detail is available in our annual report and also available on our trust website. So first of all, it, it's, uh, I'm very pleased to say that we achieved our key statutory financial duty. We have a duty to achieve a break-even position, so not to overspend um, the income that we receive every year. Um, you'll also understand, if you've attended these meetings previously, that we are allocated a target for the end of the year, a financial target by NHS England, um, and they call this a control total. So what we were, what we were challenged to achieve in that year, 1819, was to have a surplus at the end of the year of £760,000. So essentially what that means is we were expected to provide our services in a very safe way, to a very high standard, and still have £760,000 left at the end of the year from all of the income that we've received. So that's what, that was the challenge for us. Now, I've talked previously at these meetings about provider sustainability funding. So if we achieve our year-end target, we would then receive £1.5 million of this additional funding. 
But it's not funding that we were able to spend. It would be added to our surplus at the end of the year. So that would mean, all things being equal, we would have a surplus at the end of the year of £2.2 .2 million. However, we slightly exceeded our target for the end of the year, so we were then issued with a bonus payment of that money of another £1.5 million, which resulted in us having a surplus at the end of the year sorry, it should have moved that on, of £3.7 million. So that was the surplus at the end of the financial year 1819. Now, as you're aware, we're a public body. We're not in this to make profit, so you would, you would wonder why we've ended up having such a surplus and why we haven't spent that on additional patient care. As I've mentioned, three million of that was provider sustainability funding and we weren't allowed to spend it. It was just added to our position at the end of the year. What that did allow us to do, to do though, because we'd, uh, we'd had a healthy financial position, we're also evaluated by the regulators, NHS improvement on our financial performance. And there's a number of calculations that are made every month and then they're done again for the final, uh, final time at the end of the year. And we're given an, a use of resources assessment and you're given a number on a score of one to four. And if you score a four, Karen and I would probably be down in London being grilled on why the financial performance is so poor in the organisation. But thankfully we scored a one. Now that one tells the regulators that we are financially sustainable for the foreseeable future. It doesn't guarantee anything, but it says that all things being equal, as we're currently operating, we're financially sustain uh, sustainable. So that was a really, really pleasing uh, outcome for the year. So I'll talk about what, how we invested in our assets because we have a programme of capital spend every year that we invest in our buildings, etc. I'll explain to you where our income comes from and how that's broken down. I'll talk about our expenditure and what we spent that money on and also some of the savings that we managed to achieve. So in terms of our funding, where does our funding come from? So all altogether in that year we had £83 million worth of income. That was up slightly on the previous year. The previous year we had £78 million, so we had about a 6% increase overall. You'll notice there the big blue se segment, um, £44.5 million of our income comes from CCGs. Uh, so that's about 53% of our, of our income altogether. That's not all necessarily from um, Wirral CCG. A big slice of it is, but we do have money coming in from uh, Cheshire CCGs as well. Um, we've got some money from NHS England. There was £6 million from NHS England, but £3 million of that was the funding I've just talked about for the... Um, provider sustainability funds. We also, about 30% of our income comes from local authorities, and that, that includes Cheshire East um, Local Authority and Wirral Local Authority, because of course we provide services for children uh, 0 to 19 for East Cheshire and for Wirral, and of course we're also funded for providing the adult social care service, so that's the money that we get from local authorities. We've got an education and training budget of uh, just over two million pound, but about 1.7 million of that is money that we hold on behalf of Cheshire and Mersey as part of Health Education England. And there's a series <coughs> of bids made against that money and we just allocate it once that's been approved. So we hold the money and then we allocate it. So it's, it's not necessarily for our, for our use. We also have money coming in, about 2.6 million pounds from other trusts and other foundation trusts from around the patch. Because, for example, we are subcontracted to provide our musculoskeletal services and our physio services. We're subcontracted by Wirral Teaching Hospitals to provide that. So when we classify our income, the money we get paid for that will go into the, uh, the coding for NHS Trusts and, and other foundation trusts. And then we've got rental income of one and a half million because uh, we don't occupy all of our buildings. Um, some of the buildings we own, some of them we rent, and of those that we own, if we uh, rent space out to other organisations, both private and public, then we, we recover some rent for that naturally. So that's where that <coughs> rent and uh, income figure comes from. So in terms of how we've spent it, so if you do the maths, we spent about 80 million. Um, employee costs were the most significant part of that. In fact, 72% of our budget to spend is on staffing. Um, so that's, that's the equivalent of 57 million, 57 and a half million, because we've got about 1,400 whole-time equivalents. If you count your part-time staff, we've probably got about 1,800 employees overall. So quite a significant chunk of our, um, our budget goes on staffing. We've got the cost of the board there. And then nine million pound was spent on supplies and services. So that's the things that we use to run our service every day. So anything from syringes to medical equipment, 
um, so to the dressings that we use. So a significant amount of our spend there. Obviously, we've got to manage our establishment. We've got to pay for maintenance and our utility bills, our heating, lighting. So we spend another 2.6 million on that. And then we've got about 6.7 million on the rent of our buildings and the business rates that we have to pay as well. Now, depreciation's in there at 1.8 million. Depreciation, in simple terms, we've put money aside to replace our buildings and our equipment. And every year, depending on how long a life, a useful life, we've got left in our equipment, we put a proportion of money to one side to build up ready to replace those assets when they require it. And then, obviously, I mentioned the education and training budget earlier um, that we held on behalf of Health Education England. Well, we spent that as well. So the bids were approved and we issued that money. Now within our expenditure, obviously we're driven every year to find efficiencies because the money we receive doesn't necessarily cover inflation and the rising cost of our salaries for our staff, etc. And we achieved savings in that year of £2.5 million, which is a fantastic achievement. And we do that by asking our staff to generate ideas. Um, so we improve productivity in some of our services. We introduce the use of technology to drive efficiency and to, and to cut costs. And we also rationalised our estate. We're constantly looking to make the best use of our estate, stop paying expensive rent in one area, move into another area, move from properties that we lease to properties that we own wherever possible. So we achieved some significant savings that year, which was a real success story. So I mentioned that we invest money in our assets every year. This is known as capital expenditure. So we spent just over two and a half million in the year in question. Um, 1.6 of that was spent on um, technology, um, IT equipment, because as you can imagine, as a, with a mobile workforce, we need to equip them with smartphones, we need to equip them with laptops, those laptops need replacing on a regular basis, because that's how they access patient records and update them when they're, when they're out seeing patients. So we spent significant amounts of money on that, we've also invested in video conferencing, because our services stretch anywhere from Wallasey through to Macclesfield, so it makes sense for us to have video conferencing facilities, such as, that's what this is here, so that we can con make contact with people and have people access our meetings f uh, remotely from afar, and therefore they don't have to spend time and money traveling across the patch. So we also invest every year in medical equipment. We replace medical equipment, so we spent just short of 270,000 pounds on that. Included in that were a few echocardiogram machines for our heart support service. Um, some bariatric chairs and other nursing equipment. So we have a list of medical equipment and it's regularly assessed and we have a programme of replacement. We also spent about 650,000 on refurbishment of the estate. Some of that was spent on this building. This was an empty old, uh, one of the old wards from the old hospital that used to be here. And we've had it refurbished and we've now got five or six fantastic training room facilities. Um, so we're providing training up here on this site. So we invested in that. Um, we also refurbished the x-ray department that's on site here, that was completely refurbished and we are required to redecorate the St Catherine's <coughs> building on a periodic basis and so we had that decorated as well. So that, that's essentially what we spent on capital in 2018-19. So just to touch on this financial year for 1920, um, again we were given a control total. So this year we need to achieve a smaller surplus, recognising that things are getting more difficult. We need to achieve a surplus of 5,000 and then we will be given £990,000 of provider sustainability money if we achieve that. And we're currently on target, um, as we stand, we're on target to achieve our control total for this year. In order to stay financially um, sustainable though, we've had to achieve savings again. So we've got a target this year of uh, two million pound, but again, we're on target, we're on track to achieve those savings. And again, we're investing capital in our estate and our assets uh, the, to the same value of two and a half million pound. Um, but of course, alongside this, we have to play our part in the wider health economy. So we're also contributing to the financial challenges of the wider um, health and care economy. Okay, that covers all the uh, financial highlights, Michael. Thank you very much. Thanks. All of them. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening again. Um, so it's my pleasure to present highlights from our quality um, achievements during the year 1819. Um, you'll all be aware 
that on an annual basis, in the same way that Mark has described the annual report, we have to publish an annual quality report, which is our accountability to the populations that we serve, which really reflect what our ambitions have been and how successful we have been um, in achieving them. Um, I think to start with, quality absolutely is the heartbeat of our organisation. It drives everything that we do. You could hear um, when Michael um, opened the meeting with our journey of care story, this is how we conduct ourselves as a board and indeed as a group of leaders throughout the organisation. Um, and it is absolutely central to everything that we do, quality. So it's great, it's a great privilege for me to be able to present you with our update this year. Um, there are very specific guidelines that we have to follow when we're pulling our quality reports together on an annual basis. And this, this includes an external audit of the evidence that we're putting forward in um, our assertion that we have achieved our goals. So our quality report was published on the 30th of June this year. I'm going to present the highlights and as Mark said, um, the fuller detail is accessible um, online. Um, as part of the development of our annual report each year, we have quite a broad consultation with a number of partners, including Healthwatch, our Governors Forum um, for Quality, our own staff and our commissioners as well within the system. So it's a really um, thorough process by which we determine what our quality goals are year on year. So as part of that um, review, we are required to identify three trust-wide quality goals that relate to safety, experience and effectiveness. That's what we're required to do as part of that process. And I think really importantly, when we were deciding on the goals that we were going to set for 1819, we wanted to be very inclusive, recognising the integration of our organisation. So during the period of 2018-19, we have been very successful in achieving um, the goals that we set for ourselves. So I will talk you through those goals um, one by one so that you can get a flavour for where we targeted our efforts and what indeed we achieved. So during 2018-19, we achieved a 55% reduction in avoidable pressure ulcers. This was identified as a really important priority when we were having our conversations with um, our colleagues at Healthwatch and other public um, members mm -hmm. as well. Harm shouldn't happen ever and we have an absolute aspiration to achieve a zero position in pressure ulcers. It's very difficult to achieve that in a community setting. So we're really proud of the fact that during that period of time we reduced our rate of avoidable pressure ulcers by 55%. This continues to be a priority for us this year and we've made even further improvements this year. So this is certainly something that I'm sure I will be um, feeding back to you on next year when we meet in this meeting. We achieved 100% completion of the National Early Warning Score for patients at risk of sepsis. This is really important and a, um, a goal that was very high profile last year and continues to be this year. We were keen to play a lead role in this and we led um, a very extensive education programme both within our organisation and across the system and worked with other partners to really improve our responsiveness and early identification of sepsis. And then the third safety goal was relating to our responsiveness in our social care services. This is really important um, in terms of making sure that people receive the care that they need in a very timely way. I think the journey of care story that we heard at the beginning of the meeting really focuses our mind on this. So something that we're, we're very much committed to. And during 1819, we reduced allocation times and increased the number of new assessments undertaken by social care colleagues across the trust. We set a really challenging target um, and we continue to track that target this year, but our social care colleagues are doing a fantastic job in really improving the timeliness of their interventions and assessments. The next
category of quality goals then is patient or service user experience. And I think we're very clear as a board, only by understanding people's experience of care can we continue to improve the services um, that we deliver. So during 2018-19, we took a lead role in designing the frailty pathway across Wirral. This has been a really important piece of work and has led to a much better response, again, for people living with frailty. Karen referenced earlier our services such as tele-triage and trusted assessor. All of these services have really supported making sure that people who are frail um, remain in their own home wherever possible. So a really important piece of work that we're very proud of. I'd be happy to explain what a pathway is because some people might not know what exactly a pathway, a pathway. is. Okay, I'm very happy to do that, Michael. So a pathway of care, you'll know that there is quite a complex system of health and care um, out there. So a pathway of care is literally following an individual from the beginning to the end of their journey of care. That might, might take them through a number of organisations and might require a number of people being involved in their care. So a key focus of our um, co-design of the frailty pathway is to focus on continu continuity and, and coordination of care for any individual that's um, travelling through that journey. Yeah. Does that explain it? It's great. Brilliant. Thank you. We completed six shadowing events across all clinical divisions. So our shadowing events are individual members of staff, not necessarily clinical staff, because some of our non-clinical staff led um, some aspects of this work and actually got a deeper insight into the journey of that person's care. They're quite in-depth, qualitative processes again, to understand at every single milestone of that person's journey, whether it's a conversation with a receptionist as they walk into a service, or whether it's um, a transfer of their care to another service, it's really important to understand the whole of that journey. Um, and the learning that came out of that has led to significant improvements in our care provision. We embedded the Always Events framework, and this is a framework where we ask people directly what matters to you in your care, and then we really focus on that one thing that really matters to them. And we've got some ex excellent <coughs> examples of where we've improved that. One example of which is in our young people's service, where our school-aged children weren't clear who their school nurse was, didn't know what they looked like, and therefore felt they couldn't access <coughs> Um, support from the school nurse. So in all of our um, secondary school settings now, there are posters up in every school with lovely mug shots of school nurses with directions for where um, informal conversations can take place for those young people. So that was just one example of our always events. <coughs> in terms of effectiveness, this is something that, again, we're really proud of. We take seriously the importance of training and development of our staff. It's a core element of safety. And during 18-19, um, we achieved an overall compliance rate of 93%. So that exceeded our target of 90%. We're never going to achieve 100% because staff, unfortunately, have periods off um, from work. So we are really clear that we want to keep this um, as close to 95% as we can, and we're achieving that now. And really importantly, we achieved a 97% <coughs> compliance rate against our data protection regulations training, which is a significant um, achievement for us. We focused on quality improvement, and we trained um, 50 of our staff to be improvement practitioners and we facilitated quarterly quality improvement forums. Really important to instill that energy for innovation and continue on our conversations about how we can become more digital in our care delivery because um, that's so important. So that's a summary of our success during 1819. And then as part of the quality report, we published our goals for this current year, 1920. And you can see that a couple of the goals that I've described to you are flowing again through this year, avoidable pressure ulcers um, 
and response times in adult social care. We're also focusing on our safety culture within incident reporting. Um, patient experience is equally as prominent as it was in 1819, as is clinical effectiveness. And I'm really happy to report that against all of those quality goals this year, we're achieving um, amber or green RAG ratings consistently. And those that are amber are tracked very robustly through the organisation. At the bottom of the screen there, you can see that we have four sequins. They're um, schemes that we agree with um, our commissioner that we're really going to focus on improving as well. And we're doing a great job. Sorry, you've got to say what a sequin is as well. Sequin. I knew you were going to say that um, <laughs> to me. So, um, commissioning, for commissioning for quality. Thank you, Mark. I'm blind. Commissioning for quality improvement. <coughs> And innovation. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> Rescued by the director. Give you the jargon. By the chief finance officer. Um, I should have put that on my notes. So that's a summary of quality. I hope you get a sense that um, this is absolutely the thing that drives us forward. Myself and Mark work so closely together to make sure that we achieve both our financial and our quality ambitions within the organisation. I will hand now, I think, to Alice. Awesome. Chairman. Um, good evening everybody. Um, I present this report to you this evening on behalf of our lead governor, um, Bill Wiley, who... Oh, goodness. Why am I the only one that's done that? <laughs> Start again. Um, I present this report to you this evening on behalf of Bill Wiley, who is our lead governor, but unfortunately isn't able to be with us this evening, so he sends his apologies. Um, I'm delighted that I have some governor colleagues in the room this evening, so I really hope that I can give an accurate report on your behalf. Um, and what I really want to cover is, um, exactly as it says, just the report from the Council of Governors for the financial year 1819. Um, our Council of Governors is so important to us as a Foundation Trust organisation and we're really proud of the work that we complete with our Council of Governors and the engagement that we have with each and every one of our Governors from across Wirral. So I want to first of all just share with you the Governors that worked with us during the financial year. I then just want to talk to you a little bit about membership because membership really is the bedrock of our Council of Governors and I'm sure is the reason that many of you are here this evening. And then I just want to share with you some of the key achievements of the Council of Governors during the financial year 1819. So this slide just gives you an overview of the totality, if you like, of our governors during this financial year. Um, if I just take us to the next slide to give a little bit of context and explain that during this financial year, and indeed this time last year in the autumn of 2018, we held governor elections due to the fact that six of our public governors and two staff governor seats had um, come up for re-election due to ends of terms of office. So we ran our governor elections. They are always run in accordance with the model constitution and the um, rules for elections. And they're always run independently from our organisation. So you will see that we were delighted to welcome back a number of governors who actually started a second term of office with us during the course um, of last financial year. But we also welcomed some new governors into the council. All of our governors, when they start, have an induction with us to understand the role of the council of governors. It's a really important role as a Foundation Trust organisation and in fact our governors actually carry um, some statutory responsibilities so we want to make sure that our governors really understand the importance of that role and also that we give them the tools and we give them the information that they need to ensure that indeed they can conduct that role um, appropriately. We did say goodbye to a couple of our governors who had reached their end of their term of office and decided that they weren't going to restand. Um, but gave us such wonderful contribution during their three-year term of office, um, not least in that they supported us to get through our Foundation Trust application. 
And you'll see that we also then continued the year with two vacant seats in Wirral South and also within our staff constituency. Um, we are now in the middle of more governor elections where we're really hopeful that we will fill any vacant seats. So a little bit of movement from our governors during the financial year 1819, but I hope it's fair to say that we continued with strong engagement with our governors involved in some really important business across the trust as you will see. So I mentioned membership and membership really is the bedrock to the Council of Governors. It's from our members that we elect our governors and as a foundation trust it's so important that we are indeed accountable to the populations that we serve and it's therefore so important that we have our members that can really bring forward that public voice. Um, so that they can share ideas and really help us improve our delivery of services. So we're really proud that since our Foundation Trust authorisation in 2016, we've maintained really healthy membership numbers. And you can see there, at the end of the financial year 1819, we were just shy of 8,000 members, broken down by public and staff. But perhaps most pleasing and actually surprising to us was that we had over 1,000 young members aged 16 to 21. Um, we've made a lot of effort and engaged a lot with our local community um, and with our young people, going into schools, talking about careers, um, talking about ways of working with the NHS, as Karen mentioned earlier. And we were just delighted by the numbers that therefore came through with over 1,000 young members um, being part of our organisation. And that's just a really strong and important voice for us to hear. During the financial year, we established and strengthened what we now refer to as our Your Voice group. Um, anybody with a keen eye or certainly within your handouts may have noticed that this year we have a quality goal which is associated with the work of the Your Voice group. So we've really embedded um, the voice of our local population into the quality of our organisation, and we see that as absolutely fundamental and so important. So the Your Voice group, which I'm probably going to do a bit of a plug for, to be honest, um, is a membership group, and we came together only yesterday. We have members of our Council of Governors around the table and we have members from across the Trust invited. And you'll see there, I've just included some of the um, responsibilities and duties that we've outlined in the terms of reference for that group. But effectively, it's to really ensure that local people are having an opportunity to get involved in service developments across the Trust, in initiatives that we're rolling out, to actually contribute, for example, for the development of patient information, um, Yesterday we looked at a community nursing leaflet. Um, yesterday we had our Rehab at Home team talking to our members about new initiatives that they'd like to have. So really, really engaging meeting and I think just absolutely underlines the fundamental of importance um, of membership within our organisation. So we're very proud of that group and um, I've included Linda's email address on the bottom of the slide. Lovely Linda is over here. Many of you I know will know Linda as our volunteer and membership development manager. Um, Linda and I work together on the Your Voice group and we're always keen to hear from any members who would like to learn more about the group and perhaps we could even put you in touch with maybe some of our governors that um, sit on and contribute so well to that group. So that's membership. We continue... Yes, Lynn. Oh, sorry, Ali. Can hmm? I just point out that we, we, we said we came together only yesterday. It's just that wasn't our first meeting. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. It, it wasn't. Was our, it, it, people that don't know might think that was our very no. first meeting. <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Meeting. That's a really, really <laughs> helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Indeed, yeah. we came together yesterday. It's so fresh in our minds. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we've been meeting for about 12, 12 months now, if not longer. Um, but yes, we, we had a meeting yesterday, which, uh, which was great, wasn't it? Thank you, Lynn. Um, so I mentioned then that while... Oh, I've done it again. <laughs> yeah, I think I might be pressing the wrong side. Um, so I mentioned that what I also wanted to do is just share with you some of the achievements of the Council of Governors during 2018-19. And I just want to pick out a couple of key areas here. As I mentioned, the governors do have some really um, important statutory responsibilities as part of our Foundation Trust Constitution. Um, and 
Paula has mentioned the development of the quality report, which is nationally mandated and has taken you through our performance as reported in that um, quality report. But fundamentally, the Council of Governors supported the um, indicators that were going to be tested as part of that quality report. Our Council of Governors come together as a, as a quality forum on a quarterly basis, meeting with Paula, um, and it's the governors who actually contributed um, and agreed which indicators we were going to test as part of that quality report. Really importantly, our Council of Governors appointed two new non-executive directors mm. in 1819, both of whom are with us this evening. Um, and also, the Council of Governors approved a revision to our Foundation Trust Constitution. That is simply the document that just tells us exactly what we need to be doing to be fit and proper as a Foundation Trust. And it's the Governors who worked with us to approve an amendment to that Constitution following a consultation ex exercise um, through which we agreed that we would be changing the name of our organisation to Wirral Community Health and Care. Finally then, in terms of other achievements of the Council of Governors, um, really importantly that as an organisation we involve our governors in our organisational strategy. So our governors were invited and participated in a number of focus groups when we were refreshing our organisational strategy. And also through one of our formal meetings, we present to our governors our annual operational plan so that our governors have an opportunity to understand our priorities for the forthcoming year. Also really importantly, our governors, at every opportunity, we like to invite to be part of trust events. So our governors contributed to the judging day that we held for our annual Heart Awards ceremony and also participate and accompany our non-executive directors um, at every given opportunity to attend um, visits to our services. So I think that covers, um, in very high level terms, the achievements of the Council of Governors in 2018. I mentioned that we are now in Governor elections. Um, it's that time of year again, um, and I'm sure as members you may have already received some information. The nomination window has now closed, so we have received all of the nominations um, for those interested in standing for election. And all of you that are members of the Trust um, will be receiving a voting pack by the end of this week, if not early next week. Um, our voting will officially begin on Friday of this week, and then the poll will close on the 10th of December with our results declared on the 11th, just before we go to the polls. <laughs> I can provide you with absolute assurance that... Um, Whilst we have said per the restrictions, we have checked, we have double checked, and we are um, absolutely right and proper to go ahead with our governor elections. And we really wanted to because we've had an awful lot of interest and enthusiasm. So we're delighted and really, really hopeful that um, come the 11th of December, we will have a full Council of Governors once again. Um, and we plan to meet as a Council of Governors for a full induction um, day at the beginning of January. So I think just my um, final slide is, I think it's really important for you as members to know how you can contact your governors. Um, your governors have the voice within the organisation and we think that's really important. So I feel very lucky to work very closely with our Council of Governors. Um, so I can always be contacted um, to be the conduit back to our governors. But also there we've just included our phone number for the corporate office and also an email address um, should anybody want to contact governors and we will pass your details on accordingly. Um, many of our governors attend trust events, so if you're ever attending trust events, it's pretty much certain that our governors will be there as well and you could have an opportunity to meet with them. Um, and then I've done a final plug here because again, our lead governor does come to our public board meetings. So as Michael said earlier, we meet in public um, as a board on a bi-monthly basis. So there is an opportunity for you to attend. If for any reason you can't, all agendas and papers are published on our website. So I hope that that is an accurate reflection of Council of Governor activity during 2018-19. Sure, Thank sure. you.
One thing that uh, I didn't say is that one of the important roles of the Council of Governors is to sack the chairman when that's appropriate. So <laughs> they have some important duties to do as well. Uh, one other thing I also add to what Ali said is that we have just introduced the idea of development days for governors, which allows us the opportunity to have more informal meetings, discuss things in, in some depth. And that, I think, is, is, is a, good, a good way forward. Now I'm embarrassed, because this is usually the most exciting part of the members' meeting where we can have the discussion and debate, but sadly we can't. So all I can do is to say, I'm delighted you came tonight. I hope you didn't think it was completely worth, I hope it was a worthwhile meeting, even though it's quite stilted because of Perda. But um, if you have questions, do fill them in, and I hope the next members' meeting will be back to normal. Can I just ask a question? You're going to put, put, you're going to put in your I question. I think when we ask questions at yep. meetings like this, we can hear everybody's questions. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, how can we go about finding out all the questions that you're being asked and all the answers mm. given to them? Uh, how can you handle that? Yeah, any ideas? If, if everybody asks questions, we could maybe put together on our public website the questions and answers that have been um, mm. yeah. asked and the responses that we've given. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that would be okay. Good. Can, can I just make some comments? No questions there, yeah. but that, uh, because it's particularly uh, apt in what's been said tonight. I have had a very bad year this year, uh, and I've been involved in Arpa, uh, St. Catharines, <coughs> and Broad Green. Mm. And at every stage, I have had nothing but wonderful treatment. I was fortunate enough to m meet one of the, the uh, cardiologists, I think he must be, in Arab Park. I can't, I'm not sure of his name, I can't pronounce it, or something like Zabir. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely marvellous to me. It culminated in me going to Broad Green to have a double bypass and a new valve. And at every stage, and I'm still using St. Catherine's Cardiac Rehab, mm -hmm. be and the staff there are second to none. And I just wanted to make that. Uh, we're kind of spirit because I've had treatment in Harrow Park, St Catharines, and also Broad Green. So I endorse what you said. My experience has been the same. Thank you for that. We'll take that back. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming, and next time we'll have more dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.